Good evening, everyone. I'm Doug. Um, welcome to another session of Fast Start. So what we try to highlight here, like Travis says, is uh, different skills. So in this skill set session, we're learning all about veneering. So veneering is a really cool way to accent a project or create the whole project from veneer by covering up um, plywood or MDF panels. So like Travis says, this is week three of our project so far. So I'm gonna just kind of highlight what we have done so far. So um, in our first session, we cut up veneer and we laminated some uh, Baltic birch uh, pieces of plywood, okay? And then in the second session, we actually trim those out and we cut those on the bandsaw. And then last, in the last session, last thing we did was we made joinery in the ends. So there's a couple of different ways you could do boxes. You could certainly do a standard 45 degree miter and then try to glue the boxes together. Um, depending on the thickness of the material, you may want to add splines, but I chose to do um, just rabbit joints. I'm going to hold this up, get the best corner. I'm going to right here. So I chose to just do rabbit joints. So these overlap. Now the downfall of that is we have an exposed edge of the plywood. But what we're going to do is later on, if, if we have time tonight, we will. If not, we'll do it next session. We're going to cover these with mahogany. Now, the mahogany is not going to be proud of the surface. We're actually going to take a router bit. And this is probably a proud eighth inch, maybe a sh short 3 sixteenths in thickness. And it's uh, about 5 sixteenths of an inch wide. So we're going to inlay this, make it flush with the panel and then that will cover all of the edge of the plywood okay hey doug that mahogany that is consistent thickness throughout so that once you've uh, measured it with your um well, one second hold on oh let me see if i can mute that hold on just a second sure um, so anybody who wants to talk, all you have to do is unmute yourself or hold the space bar down to talk. But uh, you'll then just cut with your router or recess exactly the same thickness as your mahogany? Great question. So we actually want to leave it a little proud, okay. maybe 30 thousandths proud. Okay. And then we could uh, take a block plane, take it down a little bit, and then take a sanding block a sanding block and then level all the way around. And the reason we do that is if there's any inconsistencies on a router cut or the thickness of the material, we can make them all even as we go around. Got it. Okay. okay Great thanks. question though. So while we're on that subject, so there's another way we can actually do this and that is we can make a 5 16 square piece of mahogany, and then we could make a groove all the way through this on both sides. So in other words, it would be 5 16 here, here, and then it would be 5 16 here, and then we would just set that into the recess, and that would make it consistent, and we wouldn't have to worry about overlapping the pieces, it would all be one solid piece inside here. Got it. That's typically the way we do it, but um, we could do it either way as we go along. So we're going to set the box aside for now. And we're going to work on the top. So what we have to do left on the box is we need to make the top. We need to glue the top into uh, the the box frame that we have now. And then one of the other things we're going to do next week is after that's glued up, we're actually going to cut this 
in half. We're gonna come down about an inch and a quarter for the lid and we're gonna cut all the way around and cut into the box because the whole box at that point will be sealed. So in other words, it's you can't get inside of it unless we cut ourselves a lid, okay? And we're gonna work on cutting the lid and then we will edge band this on the bottom and the top with the mahogany and dress up the plywood so you don't see the plywood on the top of the box or the bottom of the lid. And then we'll talk about hinges, what we can do for hinges to support that too. So Doug, you said you're doing the lid, but really what you're doing is you're putting the top in the box and only after you cut the top inch off, that whole inch plus the top would be the lid, right? That's correct. So okay. the whole the whole lid would be about uh, an inch. When you look at it for the reveal, it'll be yeah. about an inch. Okay. It'll be about an inch in depth. And then we're gonna cut that whole thing off. So notice that this is our, our box top right here. And this is half inch Baltic birch thickness. We're actually gonna rabbit this and so there's only a quarter inch reveal. So we're gonna basically come out and take the whole half inch portion of this box top after it's been, after it's, before it's veneered on, glued on. So we'll put the veneer on, we'll make a quarter inch deep route, this quarter inch deep half inch wide all the way around. So it fits inside the box. Perfect. Okay. So that way, structurally, when I cut this open, there'll be a lot of rigidity in that box when we cut that. Okay. Got it. But what we're going to do today is we're going to get really down and dirty with some veneering. So this is my box top. So this is about a quarter inch and oversize on each edge. So um, my box opening for the top of the box is like seven and a half and this is eight this way. And lengthwise it's like 10 and five eighths and this is 11. So I have an eight and a half by 11 panel that we're gonna veneer. So we're gonna make um, a matching tiger maple, and then we're gonna have a half inch border, dark border, and then we're gonna take our base material that we use for the outside of the box, and then we're gonna outline that, and then we're gonna veneer the inside, and that's what we're gonna do for today. So we're gonna use tiger, uh, ribbon, ribbon tiger maple, so you can see the, uh, the grain of the uh, veneer is just stunning. So we're gonna take that. And I've just taken off a small segment. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna kind of book match it like this. So I'm gonna put all these pieces together until I can fill in the middle section. And then I will trim that to the dimensions that I want. And that's what I'm doing now. Hey, Doug. Yes. So when you say book match, what does that specifically mean? Okay, so it's not one solid piece of veneer. I will hold these two up as you go along. So the grain of the veneer is going in different directions from one piece to the next. Yep. Okay. Okay. And that's really what we mean by book match. So you had four pieces and you oriented the grain in a way that was artistically pleasing to you? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So I have cut three of them already and I'm going to show you on the fourth one how I cut up. So I just laid this on my template that I've already drawn on the lid already and I'm going to cut these to size. 
I'm using my scalpel because it gives me a very precise cut, especially on end grain as I'm going across. Could you remind us again how thick veneer is typically? Great question. So there's um, various thicknesses of veneers. Um, typically, when you make your own veneer, um, it, you will make it about a sixteenth of an inch thick. So somewhere between sixty-five and seventy thousandths of an inch thick when you make your own veneer at home. Okay. Um, that type of veneer is typically used for what we call a double bevel marquetry or a piece that we're going to have to do a lot of sanding on that we don't want to sand through the commercial veneer. Got it. Commercial veneers, depending on the species, will be between 28 and 42 thousandths of an inch. So it can be really, really thin. What would and, those, if in terms of like one sixty fourth or one one twentieth, what are those? What what is it? Because the first one was one sixteenth, you said. Yes. And so, what would the other ones be as a as a fraction? A, a, you know? About a strong one sixty fourth. One sixty fourth. Okay. Yeah, yeah, a strong, not quite a thirty second of an inch, but a strong one sixty fourth. Got it. Thank you. Sure. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to check my seam and I'll show you here in a minute. I'm going back to my blue tape. Blue tape is my friend. So I'm gonna take the top two segments and I'm gonna use my ruler to align the pieces on the bottom to make sure that they're straight. I'm gonna take my blue tape and I'm gonna take those across there. And I'll hold this up in a second to show you what we're doing. I'm pressing the two pieces together to make sure that I have no gap in between here. So I want to make sure that those are butted up against each other and I have no gap. Doug, how did you make sure that they were actually square so that you'd have all the abutting surfaces flush with one another? So they, I used actually a square to square off the end. Great okay. question, Travis. Thank you. You asked the most intelligent questions. I'm, a, I'm so, the dumbest person in the room. So what I did was I took this piece and I scribed it straight with my ruler. So I have a 36 inch ruler and I scribed a straight line all the way across. Then I took my square and I butted up against that. And now I am square from this edge to here. So then I went ahead and took my scalpel and I scribed it from here to here. Now I have two references. I have this reference and this reference yeah. that are square. Okay. okay. Great. Great. So I want to take this up and do you see, is there any gap in there? It doesn't, other than the, the very bottom, and it might just be a reflection from. There, there is a little gap in there, okay? So we're gonna talk about how we fix that. So I'm gonna take the tape off. I'm gonna fold the two pieces over on each other. And I'm going to align them And I'm going to go to my sanding block. Actually, I like to use this one better. And I'm going to just gently rub these across, just like this, holding them together. So I have 120 on this side, and this side I have 180. I like to use the 120 for joints like this. The 180 I use across the top of a project when I do my final sanding. OK, 
Okay, it's still there. Ever so slight. Okay, now we're good. Now we can go back and align our two edges on the bottom. And again, I cut these a little oversized, so I'm not really super worried about those um, lengths right now. Okay. So we're gonna trim those when we get uh, closer. But what I want is to make sure that those are level as I go along. And if there's a very, very minute gap in between each one of these, you can fill it in with sand, with uh, sanding as you go along. Yeah. You just don't want a really obvious gap. Got it. Okay. So now I'm going to take my next two segments and I'm going to do the same thing. Not much of a gap there, but I'm going to go ahead and score these up. And again, how you do it is you bring them down on the board loosely, you, you rest them square on the sanding block, then you put pressure, finger pressure in between your thumb and your, your ring finger, and you go ahead and your forefinger, sorry, and you want to go ahead and just bring the, keep these square to the sanding plate. Because you're trying to avoid any gaps that you have in between. One more time. Okay. So I'm gonna use my same thing, my straight edge to keep them square. And this one's a little bit of a challenge because it's got a rubber bottom and it raises it up a little bit. So I'll use the flat one. Okay, now I have two halves that I'm going to mate together. I want to just lay them out and see how close they really are. They should not be too far off, but they are. So I just want to show you here. So when I lay them on top of each other, You can see on this end, I have quite the gap up here. Got it. So what I do is I fold these over on top of each other. And now I'm going to trim these square.
again, using your scalpel because it is the most precise cutting instrument you could use with the veneer. I'm gonna take my scalpel across the material lightly the first time just to score my curve that the scalpel is gonna follow as I go along. And I keep constant pressure against the ruler so I get a very clean straight cut. Doug, can you remind us again what surface you're cutting on? Um, this is a um, reusable rubber mat. Um, they're very common. I got this one actually at Hobby Lobby for like $18. So it's just a rubber mat that um, it, uh, when you curve, when you cut a curve in it, it actually collapses on itself, almost like a sponge. It almost heals itself. It, it's like a very, exactly, a self-healing um, thing. But there, um, I actually found it through a seminar, a fall seminar that we had. Um, one of the other benefits of joining the guild is every fall we have a three-day seminar and one of the presenters was, was a guy by the name of Paul Search. He lives up in Santa Barbara and he is the veneer marketry god in California. So he showed us this mat and I actually uh, went to Hobby Lobby and got one after the presentation and I've had it ever since. I use it for all my veneer work and even my parquetry and marquetry work. So even though I cut it closely with a scalpel, it wasn't exactly square. There's always going to be small variations. So another tool I like to use, and we'll break it out here real quick, is my shooting board. <clears throat> so all this is is just a piece of plywood with a couple of strips of MDF that are um, bolted down. And what's nice about this is I can put them in between. I can align the veneer pieces up. I can get them close to the edge of the MDF. And then I could use this to hold pressure against the veneer, hold it consistent, okay? And then I could take my sanding block, which is square to the board. I could just come across like this. And I could get very consistent joints on my two pieces of veneer. And of course, they're so small that you have to get something underneath to pull them through with. I remember when you first introduced that, it was a pretty simple construction, but in terms of getting veneer to fit, it really is a great job. It is. So I'm going to tape this together and show you what a great job it does. What was uh, Paul Church's last name again? How, how do you spell Paul, it? Do you remember? Paul Search. S-C-H-U-R-C-H. S-C-H-U-R-C-H. Yeah. Great guy. And, and he is very humble. Um, he's won best in show for our design of wood. And he brings down an entry, at least one entry every year to our show. It really brings a lot of credence to um, our program, our design it, it, and wood program. Is he the one who did the incredible like dresses with veneer? Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, that, uh, guys, when he said that uh, Paul Church was uh, amazing, he could have been taken as hyperbole, but I've seen, I met him up at a, a shop tour 
uh, was uh, Bernie's shop tour. Yep. And he showed me some of his work. I honestly, he's doing stuff that you just can't even fathom you would do. Uh, I'm going to try to put a link to his photo, uh, photos of his work in, um, in the search box, in the chat box. He's got a pretty awesome web page you could go to also that shows the gallery of his work that he's done. Yeah, is that, is that search woodwork? I think so. Okay. That sounds familiar. Yeah, Santa Barbara, yeah, yeah. Yep. So okay. it's funny, so his daughter wanted a very unique prom dress and Paul took the whole year to design a prom dress made out of veneer. Yeah. And it was so spectacular that um, he actually had uh, fashion designers come to him. And that is his main stay now is fashioning dresses out of veneer. Okay, here we go. So you can see oh, the wow. joints where they all um, come together yeah. in a four section. So that will be the, the emphasis of our center of our panel. Perfect. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna trim this to size based on our layout from our lid that we have. Guys, uh, if you want to take a quick peek at the wood veneer dress that Paul did, I just put it into the chat. Uh, he's got tons of work to show on the website, but when I saw that he had done this, it was incredible. Just the way it flowed. The Koa Wood cocktail dress. <laughs> and Doug, do you remember who it was that came down and gave us a general meeting presentation on veneer? He had that shop that he had huge inventories of veneer in. That's Pat and Edwards. Pat Edwards? Yeah. Yeah. He was a true believer in. <laughs> oh, he, but it's funny. So Paul does not do traditional veneering in a format called boule that Pat does. So Pat actually went to Paris and he studied for two years with master craftsmen in France on how to do a particular style of veneering. And Paul, who is Austrian, by the way, oh. um, prefers to use the different method of marquetry that we call, um, so there's two different, there's three different levels or ways to make marquetry. One is a double bevel that you use thick veneer. The other one is called a packet method where you stack all the veneers on top of each other and then cut the pattern out all at once. Oh, wow. And then the other third one is uh, called a window uh, method. And that's where you cut one piece out and you have to laid a piece of veneer underneath a underneath and basically match it up with the outline and right. it is by far the hardest uh, method to do interesting so i'm just going to trim this up make it square and then we're going to add our half inch border all the way around this
Okay, so now my, my edges are all trued up square. And now I'm ready to go ahead and do my border. It's a Got little it. deceiving. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to lay out a half inch border all the way around the, uh, the book match that we had. So I have a contrasting piece of veneer that will help highlight the center panel of the, of the lid. And I'm just going to mark out half inch. How could you be hungry after I fed you? <laughs> Guys, for those of you who don't know, that's father talking to son. <laughs> Mr. Producer is like an endless pit in the in the uh, in my kitchen. Is that Adrian? Yes, he is. It is. Yeah. A wannabe member of our guild. Yeah. Who is uh, now become addicted to 3D printing? Good for him. I can't get him to make sawdust, but he. That tech shit he loves. <laughs> so this is where it's unlike father, like son. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> so we Hello. tried to uh, we tried to do a little bit of turning last yeah. week. Is that your and, common uh, ground, turning? Um, no. So he was trying to learn how to turn because he has a project he has to do for some friends. Uh -huh. And uh, it didn't go over as well as the 3D printing. Got it. And just to be clear to people who don't know, Doug has a CNC. Doug is not a technophobe. He just happens to know hand and power tools really, really well. It's all, it's like I told Pat Duffy, CNC complements your regular woodworking. It truly does. You can make so many jigs and fixtures and everything. So what I'm doing here is I'm making a half inch border all the way around. And then I'm just rough cutting this to length because I'm going to make 45 miter joints on it when I get done. And after I put it uh, on the panel. So on some really fragile veneer, it tears out easily. And um, you could actually get it close on the cut and then you could just fold the veneer. You can fold the veneer and it will actually snap open for you. I'll try to demonstrate that here in a minute. So I'm gonna take my piece and I'm gonna tape it down. Blue tape is your friend. So that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way around the border and I'm going to put this all the way around and I'm going to overlap these ends and then we're going to make 45 degree miter cuts in a minute when I get all the ends pieces one, on. One cut through the overlap so it's a perfect fit, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. You're getting hang of this veneering stuff, Travis. You are my instructor. I'm just a beginner myself. Ah, yeah, right. But I will say that I'm partial to veneer for finishing all different variety of projects. Didn't you just, I don't know if it was for the holiday gift sale or if it was for the um, furniture accessories recently, you did an amazing veneer piece. Um, that was, uh, what was it? Payek? Payek? Oh, the guy's name is Payek? Yeah. He oh, but did. That was the first place. Didn't you get second or third or something like that? Um, no. No, oh, okay. no. I didn't actually finish my table before I left for Dayton. So oh, okay. I didn't get to enter the contest. Um, but while you're mentioning that, I did finish my uh, tabletop. Oh, 
you guys haven't seen this, be ready. <laughs> so this is what you can do with veneer. And again, this is all just scraps. So I just cut inch and a half squares. And again, I alternated the grain from the maple and then rattled a circle around the edge and then did what we call a waterfall technique on the rest of the veneer. So I cut an arch in these and then the piece extended over the end. And then I went and uh, cut it, trimmed it. I laid it upside down. So after this was glued, I laid it upside down, trimmed around the edge. I took the cut off and then matched up the grain coming down this way. It's called a waterfall edge. Amazing. If any of you would ever want to do that, um, just let me know. I'd be glad to show you. Yeah, I'm sure people from Dayton are really readily available. <laughs> well, you know, that's what Zoom meetings are for. <laughs> Once I get the other shop set up, we'll be good to go. They actually just called me today for the electrical requirements for my shop. Of course, you said uh, lots of uh, 243 phase. Well, what I actually did was when I was back there last week, my dad and I made full size templates of all my tools and spent two days laying out the whole workshop oh, on the right. floor. That must have been fun. It, <laughs> it actually, it, my basement filled up quickly. Could you tell everybody how big that space is in your basement in that new house? So I actually am moving because of a basement workshop, one of the many reasons. But uh, I have a 1,300 square foot basement in my new uh, house, on my next house. And uh, it's uh, going to be amazing to uh, try to lay out another shop Number one, in a basement, because it's something we don't have to deal with here in California, is a basement. I, I want to repeat that number again. 1,300 square foot basement workshop. Yeah. That's amazing. So hopefully it'll work out. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Since you're running 2,000 miles away to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. And leaving all my friends after 42 years. Yeah, yeah. That's why I know you're going to be back twice a year. Exactly. Because you're putting the tape there just for, to make the miters, are you that's, putting it on that that's, side? That's correct. That's correct. And guess what? This one is not going to be long enough. So I will have to shift this one. I actually cut this piece a quarter inch too short. And I'm going to put it, thank you, Mr. Producer, good thinking. We're going to put that as a side piece. Oh, was that Adrian's voice? He was, it was. Okay, okay. Yeah. No, the youngest one would never set foot in my shop. Yeah, I was that just wondering, be, I was trying to figure out if it was Marvin's voice or not. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> too, that would be too taboo for a 17-year-old uh, a to come out of my shop. <laughs> okay. Hey, Marvin, have you done any veneering? Maybe Marvin can't hear us. There yeah, I, I'm just trying to unmute myself. I've yeah. done a little bit, but nothing like this. I'm, I'm a longtime friend of uh, Pat Edwards. His wife actually taught me stained glass, and uh, believe it or oh, not, nice. 1976, so. All right. 
That's now, right. If I remember right, you've been in San Diego, what, most of your life? Uh, since 73. Yeah. So That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm so not going to Dayton. <laughs> Marvin, <laughs> Marvin, wasn't it your daughter that does stained glass? Well, I have a lot of people. No, not my daughter, but yes, we have okay. lots, lots of people. Lots so of people. you and I need to connect before I leave because I have um, a whole box of uh, H channel okay. that I am not going to take with me. Okay. Lead H channel that he can put to use? Lead H channel, exactly. Very Good nice. for you, Travis. Hey, I do stained glass. Do you? Yeah. Good for I you. Mean, <laughs> I'm so, not saying that to step in the middle of your H channel, okay? I'm just saying. Right. <laughs> that sounds Got like it. the perfect place for it, so. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see we have a consistent uh, border all the way around. So now what we're going to do is we're going to cut 45 degree miters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my short um, straight edge. Let me get this lined up here. Can you see? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to line this up with this corner. I'm going to line this up with this corner and I'm going to cut through both layers to get a 45 degree miter. And it might not even be a true 45, but because I'm cutting through both layers, they will match up as I go along. I presume you use a scalpel because you are wearing a doctor's smock. If you weren't wearing <laughs> that, what would the tool of your choice be? I would um, either you could use a single edge razor blade. Okay. Or um, I, you guess you you could use a veneer saw, but veneer saws are not really good for this because you risk, you risk you risk cutting into your your panel that you just made up. Also, Doug, wouldn't you leave a kerf because there's width to that blade? There is yeah. width to that blade, exactly. Yeah. And um, I mean, these are, they're only like $9. The scalpels are only like $9. And you could buy a pack of 50 blades for less than $12. Cool. So Doug, on the scalpel, you said before what size it was. It's a 21 or what kind of blades or something? Great question. So um, this is a number four scalpel. And uh, then the blade that I have on is a number 25. So okay. you could use a number three scalpel and use a number 11 blade. And the blade is a little thicker than the 25. And then they have- Where do you find out about scalpel sizes? Uh, great question. So you can go on Amazon and they will tell you uh, the different size scalpels they are. Another better resource is a company called Cincinnati Scalpel. And they sell, that's where we get our, within, meaning us within the community. I say all the Palomar students and whatnot. We get all of our scalpels and blades from Cincinnati Scalpel. They probably have 30 different types of scalpel blades. Uh, some are rounded, some just have a little hook, but um, the number 25 and the number 11 are the most common ones for veneering work. And the number 23 is actually a curved, a curved blade. So if you were trying to go around a corner, real tight corner, uh -huh. that curved blade really is uh, a, an extra added benefit. Thanks, Doug. Sure. Great question. On the underside of the lid, will you do just one solid uh, veneer? Yes, and we're gonna get to that. We will get to that. So after I make the joint, I wanna make sure I put a good piece of tape on it so it doesn't uh, flex around and possibly break.
So you can see the miters as they come through. Oh yeah. Does it make more sense now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to continue on the other side and then we'll go ahead and put the, the rest of the border on that the, that will be the material that matches the uh, rest of the outside of the box. So when I make the miter, I'm just going from where the two strips of veneer overlap. And then I'm just drawing the uh, scalpel across that mating surface as they go along. So these are the cases where you go through a lot of blue tape. You'll use a uh, blue tape to hold something in place and then you'll work on the backside and then you'll come back and take the other rest of the blue tape off. Not uncommon at all to uh, use that as a um, kind of an anchor point, so to speak. So between holding CNC projects down and veneer work, I go through a pretty good amount of blue tape. <laughs> Did you say that scalpel, the rounded one, was a size 21? Uh, the This blade is a 25, and the um, the rounded one is a 23. Okay, because the 21 is 44.50 for just the blade. Oh, that's, you don't need anything like that. How many is that? Is that a pack of 100? That's one. One blade? One bl you, you don't need anything like that. <laughs> oh, maybe it is one, it, maybe it is a 100 box. There I you take go. that back. Okay. Were there okay. two zeros after the one? <laughs> Not up front, but when I read the small print. Got it. There you go. Okay, so here we are. This is where we're at so far. And we are going to go ahead and make sure there's no overhang. And I have a little overhang. I want to show you before I act here. So I have a little overhang from the angle here. Yeah. I'm just going to square that off. Got so it. my rest of my material can be square as I go along. This is a great opportunity for Gary and Nancy to be careful to watch what he's doing. It's a great way to split that that veneer. So yeah. I love those cutting pads. They are great. Let yeah. me tell you. And they, you know and I found so many uses for them. Besides my veneer work, I do a lot of glue ups on this. It's flat yeah. and the glue doesn't stick to it. And um, God, you can, uh, you know, you can peel the glue right up. What's the brand on yours? I, mine is Hobbyco. Um, mine is Alvin, A-L-V-I-N. Oh yeah, I've seen that brand, yeah. Yeah, okay, so now we're gonna come back to the outside material. As soon as I can unbury them here. So this is the material that matches the outside. So I'm gonna go ahead, get that Mr. Producer. So I am going to go ahead and edge this. So it needs to be about an inch and a quarter. So what I want to do first is create a 
straight edge. And here, Travis, is where I can use my veneer saw. Was that tapping for good luck? It, so these handles come out of the, the blade come out of the handle frequently. So you just tap it in. It's a called a socket fit. Yeah. And uh, you just want to make sure that the blade is not wobbling around when you pull the handle back. And lose the head. And lose the head. Or even worse, uh, mess up your cut you're trying to make on your veneer. Doug, you okay. obviously enjoy veneering and do it well. Tell us about how much inventory you have. Like how many varieties? Um, can you scan up for a minute? So all of this up here and all of this up here is my overhead veneer storage. And on top of my dust filter on both sides, <laughs> I have uh, veneer stashes. Um, I mentioned I mentioned before about uh, Joe Woodworker. Yeah. Um, I have, this is 60 board feet of veneer, and this is how it comes shipped. So I'll go to his bargain basement, and I'll buy three or four lengths of veneer that are typically about seven inches wide, uh, eight to 12 feet long. And I could get, I mean, that whole rolled up bundle right there was like $62 for all of that veneer. You have a lot of veneer. I do, but <laughs> I'm always messing with something. Yeah. So. Cool. So I'm going to measure out about an inch and a quarter here. Don't ever go to Patrick Edwards' shop because that is a drop in the bucket. Oh, it's so Patrick has so much veneer. He actually has a a room that he stores veneer in and it keeps a dehumidifier in there to keep the ambient uh, moisture down because veneer, if it dries out in this hot weather, and I've experienced it in some of mine, is it cracks very easily on the ends. Okay, so that would be good for one section. That could probably, nope, can't quite be a side. So I'm gonna need four of those or three. Bear with me here, guys. So tonight, after the show, I will put this in the veneer press and I will glue this up overnight. And then tomorrow I will start uh, um, milling it down to the rabbit that'll fit in. So do you use hide glue? Uh, I do not. Great question. So excuse me for a second. So there's lots of different types of veneer glue out there. You can use hide glue. Here's what I find about hide glue is it cools very quick. When you have a large panel that you're trying to work with, it cools very quick. And then it's really hard to get a very flat adhesion. And you don't use hide glue with the veneer press. So we typically use a PVA type glue. Tight Bond has come out with a really cool glue that's called cold press for veneer. So I buy this at Rockler. Uh, I get the cord for about $10 and it lasts me um, anywhere from eight to 10 weeks on most of my projects. So all of the veneering that we have done so far has been with this Tight Bond cold press glue. 
you can uh, buy different types of um, epoxy resin glue. Some is in a powder form that you mix up and you only mix up the amount of uh, urethane glue that you need. And there's all different kinds of uh, poly glues out there. Hey, Doug, the, the hide glue, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that a really ancient glue made for, uh, made long ago for furniture uh, glue ups and it was a natural thing. And the reason people like it is because you can reheat it and exactly. take it apart and put it back together again. Actually, the Egyptians used hide glue. There you go. That's a while ago. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yes. So the great thing about hide glue is you can take uh, steam or uh, a damp wet towel with hot water or even a uh, heat gun. And um, you can actually break apart a joint with hide glue because it will decoagulate. I don't know if that's a technical term or not, but it'll break down the glue enough to where the rigidity of the glue will melt and you can pull a piece apart. Yeah, yeah. Now, earlier I talked about how you can score a piece of veneer. And you don't have to cut all the way through. So I scored a veneer. And I'm just going to pull this up. And that's going to make a uh, break in the veneer. And I'm going to do my two side pieces real quick. Then we'll get this glued up. I mean, uh, uh, cut up. And then we'll uh, show you what the whole front panel looks like. Hey, Rob, are you there? You're there. Uh, one of the people in our group here is just he hearing about CNC. And uh, I think you've got this remarkable story. How long ago did you learn CNC and what have you done since you take that class? Well, you mean besides amazing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, well, I, I, I got my CNC basically in November of 2019. Yeah. Started working on it in January and, uh, and then really started, uh, actively trying to um, do something when I got challenged to do that cheese board thing. Right. Yeah. That would have been what, February or March? Yeah. And, and when so did you, been, when did you take the class? Uh, I never took the class. Oh, didn't you? Oh, I thought you had. God. No, I hadn't. Mistake. I haven't taken the CNC class. Uh, okay. My mistake. No, he could teach it though. He, he can teach me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to go here. I took and the we'll... laser class is what you're remembering. Oh, uh, okay. I knew I'd had you as a student. student. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You had me as a student once or twice already. Yeah. So we're so, going to use the same technique. Go ahead. I, I don't know. This is far secondary to what you're going to say. Please go ahead. No, I, I'm just using the same technique of uh, putting the four pieces around. Go ahead, Travis. Why I, I was going to say here. that uh, we were all so impressed by what Rob was doing with CNC that we uh, asked him if he would present his experience of going from buying machine in November to producing all sorts of things. And uh, he, I just put a link in the um, chat where Rob spent an hour telling us about uh, his, his experience and uh, showed us a bunch of things that he had made. And honestly, <laughs> it's really impressive. I gotta tell you. The banks are amazing. Yeah, those are fun. For the days. holiday yeah. sale, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Little giraffes and uh, what were the other animals, Rob? Oh, man. I've made uh, giraffes, unicorns, elephants, and there's one other I can't remember what it was. Yeah. And, and I think you showed us your cheese platter in that video, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. 
Well, that was the one that had the inlay, which was what made it interesting. Yeah. The walnut inlay. Well, you know, of course, I'm most floored by your uh, semicircular recess. Yeah, the hot dog. The, the hot, hot dog shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> boy, figuring that out. I was, that was great. So my two end pieces, I ended up cutting too short. So please, Travis. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's not fill, your thing. Travis, fill in the, it fill was in the, the blanks here. I did no, that. <laughs> no, it was a rookie mistake on my part. Yeah. I didn't leave enough for the overlap for the angle cut. Got it. Well, you've told us many times that you do those deliberately so we can learn from them. It's a learning opportunity. That's right. Thank you, sir. And we'll be done here in five, ten minutes, guys. I know it's past the hour. At, just while Doug's doing that and he wants me to fill a little time for him, uh, I, I told him I wanted to make a lamp. And um, I'm going to just uh, spotlight mine for just a second here because I want to show something. The Kumiko. Uh, I told you I was going to this lamp that used a technique called Kumiko. It's a very precise friction fit lattice structure that looks gorgeous. Except mine was just going to be the Kumiko look. Um, it huh. is a lantern that it looks very Japanese and represents this technique. But there is the there is one panel right there. Okay. Now. That panel is nothing more than cut on a CNC. If you look closely, you realize I've just faked it. Okay, <laughs> this is not the real genuine article. The real genuine article will probably be presented uh, shortly in a hand tool special interest group that we have. But it has that look, and I put rice paper behind it. it you know, it looks it looks the part. But no, this is this is not at all the real thing. But CNCs can do some pretty cool stuff. They can. And I won't give you too much grief for cheating because you are donating that for our gift sale. <laughs> and it was made with your wood. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but the art of Kumi Cool itself is actually pretty cool. So I've done very the same thing. I've just put a border around and now I'm going to cut 45s and then that will fit the top of the panel. Wow. Mary Russo showed me um, the boxes that she had done the tops on and they were just fabulous. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, Russo? Yeah. 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 Mary's really good at marquetry. Yeah. Hey, Marvin, aren't you the turner? Don't you do pens? I do. Yeah. Have you done any lately? No, last time we did it was when we did that uh, turnaround for vet at Rockler. So I've got all the supplies, I just haven't done them. Yeah, yeah. Doug, do we need them for the show? I don't know, Doug. Of course. You could yeah. always do five pins for us. Okay. They're, they're a lower price point, so that helps. That's what sells, the lower price point. <laughs> Unless they're some of our wooden toys. <laughs> And then they still won't go. <laughs> well, I got a buddy over in uh, Tacna, Arizona, who's given me a whole bunch of uh, wonderful stuff. He, he's got salt cedar and all sorts of different stuff. But he, he's a member, um, but it's like anything else. Is that he's, uh, he's got 114 degrees over there right now. So Ugh. But he's given me a, a lot of uh, uh, pen blanks. So we've got some interesting stuff. So I'll get busy. Great. I just uh, cleaned up the shop before the show and I was doing, Mary had us doing uh, Christmas tournaments. Um, small Christmas tournaments, they're inch and a half diameter, two and a half inches long. It was the most technically challenging project I've done on the lathe yet. And what was it you were making again? The turned Christmas ornaments. Christmas yeah, I think balls. I remember. Her. Yes, and Dan did some too, or no? Um, I think he did some, but they were a little larger. Got it. Well, I'm glad to hear that you had problems because I, I turned into sawdust. So yes. 
I, uh, I, I have to take him in Friday and try to get the Russo stamp of approval. And uh, I think I'm going to be woefully disappointed. Well, she's awfully good. She loves turning. Man, she's a wizard, an absolute wizard. In, in her uh, marquetry, the way she uses the dye impregnated wood to just really get character. So yep. She did some birds recently on the top of a box or something. Yeah, was it with uh, Joe France or whatever his first name is? Jim France. Now? Jim France. Jim France. Boy, they turned out some beautiful work. Wow. They did. They did. So I actually took the uh, marquetry class at Palomar before it shut down. And they taught us actually how to dye our own veneers oh. in, uh, for marquetry itself. So once people figured out how to dye wood to the color they want instead yeah. of using all of this natural wood, yeah. the um, opportunities became much greater. Oh. And you saw in Mary's work that uh, obviously that you can do an endless amount of things. Yeah. But believe it or not, um, Ritz dye, like Ritz clothes dye, yep. is, what we, is what we use to dye wood with. Oh, it's like an aniline, maybe not. Um, you can aniline, that's, um, but the thing about aniline, it's a little more expensive for the dye itself. Yeah, Ritz um, dye is cheap. You can buy a box of Ritz dye for five bucks and make a gallon of your color. And I even went so far as to download, they have a, like a paint mixing chart for dyes oh. on the Ritz website. Oh. And they tell you how many parts of each color to mix to get oh, the color cool. that you want. So oh, it, it's like, but the thing is, you can't just put it on the wood. You have to put it in a pressure cooker and let it cook. Oh, really? So it's kind of like using a vacuum chamber yes. for- yes cactus juice, but yes. instead it's dye into wood. Yes. Got it. I know that sounded funny to somebody who'd never heard of what cactus juice was. But <laughs> okay, so here we are. All right. That is going to be our top panel now. So real quick. So this was my template. And this is going to go on the top of my panel. Get it squared up here. And you can see I'm going to have just the slightest amount of overlay. Yep. And I'll trim that up uh, to size. So what will happen is after I pull this out of the press, I will trim this outer edge just to fit the outside of the box. And then I'll use the router to make a dado on the inside. Yeah. So it sets into the box and then we could go from there. Hey Doug, just because we have two people who've not been in one of these before, could you just say real briefly how you get the veneer to adhere the glue and the pressure and that stuff? Okay, so I would make up my panel, be it a single panel like this or a panel like this, and I will take the glue and I will put it on with a four inch paint roller. So it's a quarter inch nap paint roller. Um, I actually buy the nine inch ones and I'll cut them up into segments uh. because after you rinse them out a couple of times, they still kind of get hard. So I will put a generous coat of this on and then I will take the paint roller and apply it and make sure I get all the corners. Now the key part is I don't want to get chintzy on the glue because I don't want a weak glue joint later on. So what I'm looking for is as I come across, it's just starting to pick up the glue as I roll the roller across okay. the panel. Okay. okay. If it rolls off in excess that I is rolling off the edge, that's way too much glue. Okay. okay? If you're rolling it and you can kind of you can almost read, you can almost read your line through the glue. That's, too, that's not enough. Okay. So when you want it, when you're rolling it across, you want to just see the back of that roller, pick up the glue a little bit 
and then uh, come across. So okay. it's just sticky. And then you put your panel on, and there's a couple of different ways you could glue it. You could uh, put it in a vacuum press, um, which is what I have, or you could take two pieces of plywood and put one on top and one on the bottom and put clamps all the way around. Melamine board is the best to go on this because it won't stick to the melamine. But if you just have standard Mark 1 Mod Zero plywood, you could put a paper bag over the top of each surface and then put your plywood down and it won't stick to the plywood panel. Okay. And when you say vacuum press, you're talking about a plastic bag that gets all the air drawn out of it and right. adds the pressure that way. Okay. So I have a 30 or 30 mil thick uh, vinyl bag that is sealed on three sides and then it's open on the one side and I slide this in, um, the panel in, and then I have to have what they call a call on the bottom that lets air escape all the way underneath this panel. And then I put a window screen mesh on top so the air can escape on the top. And the, vacu the bag, the vinyl bag actually collapses on top of this and equates to 520 pounds of pressure wow. on this. And what's nice about this glue is 45 to 60 minutes it's set and you can pull your panel out, let it set overnight and put your next panel in after the one hour mark and just cycle through your panels. Which, which type bond is that? It is called tight bond cold press for veneer. Okay, good. Thanks. Yep. They carry it at Rockler. It, you, you, before you drive all the way up there, you should call, um, call it what's his name uh, uh mike durlock mike durlock so call mike and ask him to stock check it before you drive all the way up there Got it. this totally. this flies off the shelf they always have the gallon jugs but to be honest if you're going to use a gallon of veneer you're doing a lot more veneering than i'm even doing so this is a very popular item at their store so call ahead before you go up there okay. and doug one more question sorry to have so many but yes you didn't, no no that's fine you did not apply glue to the back of the veneer. You only put it on the- Only, yes, part. exactly. Great okay. point. You only put it on the substrate. You do not want to put it on the veneer on the veneer itself. Okay. Because if you do, it's going to start to curl right away. I see, okay. Okay. And then even when I put this on, okay, I roll this out with a uh, rubber roller, and then I start putting tape on to hold the edges onto the panel yeah. so it doesn't start to roll up before I get it inside my bag. Got it, okay. Okay, okay. does that make sense? Yep, sure does. Okay, did, uh, we didn't necessarily get as far as I wanted tonight, but I hope this covered a lot of different techniques on how we can use different veneers for different patterns. And um, this is gonna be the top of our box that we'll go over next week. So next week I will have this lid glued I will have this lid glued to our box, okay? And then we're gonna start, uh, well, we're gonna finish making all of our joints. So a lot of people wanted to ask, uh, well, how did you cover these joints? I thought about using, I thought about using a thick one, but it's like, you know, um, that's a little thick for this small of a box. So I'm gonna use the thin, the thick eighth inch, uh, material and we're going to overlay this on all corners so we're going to overlay this here and overlay this here <coughs> so what else so what i'll do is i'll overlay this on this side and then i'll come and route this side and put another section over here okay. so this will go all the way around and even on this um wool miter will miter these on the inside so they have a very clean look. Um, I won't put the trim on the bottom or the top, but it will be on all the exposed sides where the plywood is. Okay. So along the bottom, along the top where this is going to set in, this will go. And then on each side, we'll have uh, 
will have this trim piece to cover the plywood. So and what's your plan for the lid to be attached to the base? Are you going to use hinges? Is it going to be just a... Uh... So yes, no, we're not going to have an inset. So we're going to actually have a hinged lid. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of different types of hinges you could use. You could use a butt hinge. Okay. The problem with a butt hinge is the lid will fall all the way back and yeah. it'll put spring tension on the hinge every time. And eventually you may pull a screw out or right. loosen one of the hinges. Rockler sells uh, a pretty cool hinge that has what they call a 90 degree stop. And they're actually go on the outside of the box. Okay. So they'll fit here. And then when you open the box, it'll stop at the 90 degree mark. It'll stop at the 90 degree mark like this. Great. And I'll actually go get the hinges tomorrow to make sure we have them. Okay. Any questions over what we're doing so far? No? You got a right. thumbs up from Marvin. Okay. Great, great job. Yeah, no so kidding. thank you for joining me in my shop tonight. I hope you learned something of a little bit about veneering. I am uh, really love to work with veneer. I think it's a really cool technique to use in your woodworking toolkit. And um, the great thing about veneer, again, is there's like 220 species of veneer out there. And, of course, they all start out as logs. But some, like this wood, are more scarce. And you can't buy these in solid timber. You can only buy this species in veneer. I'm just uh, right now, Doug, trying to figure out when your next um, session it, is. It will actually be, I believe it's the 19th, Wednesday the 19th. So today's the 5th. So 14 days from today will be the night, Wednesday the 19th. I'm looking on the calendar and it's not there yet, but we'll get it on the calendar. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Doug, Thank you, awesome. folks. Thank Thanks, you, sir. folks, for joining me. Take care. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.